Christian Church. Would you join me in the call to worship? In, gospel, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will let you do whatever comes up, whenever it comes up. Let us live in this moment of worship. Let us Let's give ourselves to holy God. The opening hymn is number 18, verses 1 through 4. Would you join me, please?
out to each other with a hand full of love. Or a hug. What? <laughs> Chicago area. 
She will be ordained sometime after the first of the year as a disciple pastor. I love that during our opening hymn, she had the hymnal open because guess what? Dan Merrick, her grandfather, was the editor of the Child's Hymnal. Our hymnal. She comes from a rich family of disciples. But she is coming on board. And she's Growing her work here at Cypress Creek, and she will become missional pastor, which means we want her to focus beyond these walls. We want her energy really focusing on young adults, and that means that she needs to be out in the community. And so, yes, you will see her around here some, but we really don't want her to spend a lot of time here. We want her out there. So we want to make sure that we introduced her this morning, and I hope you will get to know her in the weeks and months ahead. Now, as you came in, you maybe noticed on the end uh, of some chairs here some prayer blankets. You're going to soon see them. Uh, what I'm going to do is invite those to be passed out. And what I want you to do is take a hold of it and just look at it for a moment and then pass it on. But as you hold it, I want you to think about this prayer blanket. And I want you to begin to kind of process the people that will receive these prayer blankets. Maybe somebody in the hospital. Maybe somebody in the nursing home. Maybe someone who has just moved to hospice. Or maybe someone who just received some bad news, maybe about a family member. These go out into the community. And I am so thrilled that we as a congregation take this ministry seriously. If you help to create these prayer blankets, please raise your hand. Thank you for that. <laughs> and as those are being passed around this morning, I'm going to ask you to join me in a prayer for these prayer blankets. You are magnificent, Lord. Magnificent in your, in your capacity to take something so simple, something ordinary, and through the love and kindness of those who offer their gifts, you're able to make something extraordinary, an expression of your merciful kindness. Today we pause to ask for your blessing upon these prayer blankets, yet we must acknowledge that it was your blessing that enticed the creativity of those who first started this ministry. It is your holy blessing that called forth those who were willing to provide material and skill and time and encouragement to the making of these special blankets. So blessings already abound. And we simply acknowledge how your blessings have been woven into every inch of these blankets. And wherever they may find a home, you, you, oh God, you, you will make a way for these blessings to envelop the people who find themselves encircled by the gift of a blanket. May they be a part of the larger ministry of care that happens in and through this community of faith. We ask all of this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you have one of those prayer blankets at the end of the aisle, don't take it home with you, unless you need it. Or maybe you're thinking of somebody who needs it. And then it's okay. Um, that's part of how this happens. People will come by the office and say, I have, a, I have a friend that I think would be blessed by one of those. And you can come and look through. There are ones that have trains on them and others that have patterns and all kinds. So maybe pick up the one you think would be perfect for that person that you know. This morning, we are going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. And I'm going to be reading some words from the 8th chapter. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. A man named Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. 
He pleaded with Jesus to come to his house because his only daughter, a 12-year-old, was dying. As Jesus moved forward, he was smothered by the crowd. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had spent her entire livelihood on doctors, but no one could heal her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his clothes, and at once her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When everyone denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she couldn't escape notice, she came trembling before Jesus. In front of everyone, she explained why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well, Jesus said. Go in peace. Go in peace. May we hear these words with open hearts and open minds. You join me in prayer. For all of us, all of us, who seek healing in some aspect of life, we turn to you, Lord. We turn to you and reach out to you. For in you we find love and mercy and hope. Now provide for us an awareness of what you are doing in this time of worship today. In the name of Christ. You ever watched one of those wildlife shows? You know the ones where you have the, the plains or the jungle or the forest or whatever the scenery might be, and then suddenly you hear the voice of the wildlife expert. He sounds like he's on leave from recently doing the play-by-play -play for the British Open Golf Tournament. <laughs> in hushed tones, he says, watch closely, as the alpha male asserts himself by first pounding his chest. Oh, oh, look, look at this magnificent creature here, parading around with tail feathers, in great splendor. Oh, look at her, as she marches around, intimidating the smaller one. I do a lousy British accent. <laughs> but you know the shows, don't you? You've watched them on Animal Planet or National Geographic or, or PBS. But have you ever witnessed those same behaviors in the workplace? At a party? At a family reunion? At a sports bar? Oh, sure, maybe not literal feathers, or maybe not technically anyone beating their chest, but there's power being put on display with a purpose to intimidate or dominate, to show off, to draw attention. Now, I have no interest in making light of this, because it plays itself out in, in some pretty unhealthy, destructive, damaging, even sometimes deadly ways. Even our precious disciples were not immune from this. The folks who heard Jesus speak firsthand about humility and gentleness, the people who saw firsthand Jesus act with, with compassion and mercy, they seemed unaware of the implications in their own lives for what Jesus was attempting to communicate. It may have started when Jesus took three of the disciples to the top of the mountain. We know it's the mountain of transfiguration. He took three, which means he left some of them down below. You can just imagine the conversation. Why did they, why did they get to go? 
I, I shouldn't be part of it. I mean, I understand why he didn't take you. What do you mean, why he didn't take me? Why didn't he? You, you just imagine this conversation going on. You imagine them kind of getting bent out of shape. And it goes on with them kind of chest pumping. You know what I'm talking about. And they, they talk about who's the greatest among them. And two of them even send their mother to go talk to Jesus so that they can get a, a special place of recognition. And at one point they feel threatened because some strangers are casting out demons. And they say to Jesus, make them stop. They're not one of us. Which Jesus says, basically, get over it. <laughs> it reminds me of the time I was asked if I'd be one of the sponsors at a junior high dance. There wasn't a lot of dancing actually happening on the dance floor. But there was dancing. I'd call it the dance of power that was happening all over the place. On the other side of the gym, around the snack tables, in the bathroom hallway in the bleachers, lots of primping and parading, lots of posing and self-promoting. Some folks looking at these young people would say, they're so full of themselves, but I would say, no. In fact, many of them feel very empty of themselves. But among those who are attempting to be pompous and haughty, if you're paying close attention, there was another group who felt powerless in this structure. Young people who had pretty much accepted their place underneath or below this other group. And the woman who approached Jesus, she knew that place very well. Remember, Jesus is on his way to some place that's very important. He's been approached by a very important leader in the community, Jerry. He's been asked to come and help. He's on his way there. And this woman, she shouldn't interrupt something so important. She is not important. In fact, she's not even named in the story. By every measurement of the day, she had no status, no authority, no, no nothing. And on top of everything, she was sick. She, had, she was ill. Another strike against her, at least in the eyes of some, who believed that illness was a sign of God's disfavor. And 12 years, physically exhausting, emotionally devastating. And so it's surprising that she finds even just a glimmer of hope. May not be rational, may not be prudent, but maybe this, this Jesus, maybe. Yet she convinces herself that she cannot approach him. But maybe she can just steal a little anointing as he walks by. Maybe just brush up against it. For any interruption, any intrusion into that world is not possible for someone like her. There is this, this perceived sphere of power, and she is not invited in. Oh, over the years, I have met so many people who, on the surface, from a distance, appear to have their lives put together. They seem to have it all figured out, and yet you get a little closer, you get to know them, and they're no different than the woman. Convincing themselves they do not belong, they are not worthy, they do not have the right standing. They've convinced themselves of this because others have told them, or have at least made it clear in other ways. And so she, this woman, representing so many others, remains hidden in the crowd and allows only her hand to kind of slip through and brush up against the hem of his garment. Probably that part that had been dragging the dirt. That's the part that she believes she might be worthy of touching. And then the story just stops. 
as Jesus says, who touched me. People deny it. And even Peter says, Jesus, I mean, everybody is surrounding you. Everybody is touching you. But Jesus said, no, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Power has gone out from him. Is Jesus sharing power as if he is kind of a reservoir of power? Is Jesus the, the Oprah of power brokers and you get power and you get power and, and you get power? Is Jesus, is Jesus trying to give power to someone who feels powerless so that she can be invited into the sphere where power is the commodity? Providing for her the currency so that she can have access to this game. Or could it be that Jesus is doing something completely different? That he's actually sick and tired of the destructive system of power and is offering something very different. A lot of Bible translations, including the one that I read from, has Jesus saying, someone touched me, I know that power has gone out from me. Power. I think most of us have a picture in our mind when we say the word power. We, we kind of know what it's like, what it looks like. But it's interesting to me that the King James Version translates it as virtue has gone out. Virtue? Power? In the opening chapter of this gospel is the story of, of, the, of the birth of Jesus. But before Jesus shows up on the scene, there is this divine messenger that appears to Mary and tells her that soon she will be pregnant. And at first, she's kind of frightened. She doesn't know exactly how to take it. How can this be, she asks. And, and the response is, nothing is impossible for God. Impossible. That's the same Greek word there that we translate as power, just with the prefix not put in front of it. Possible? Power? Virtue? That which moved from Jesus, might I suggest this morning, may not be power as we usually think about it, as the world tries to sell it. Instead, it was something that maybe was beginning to unleash, uncap, unchain all the possibility and potential that was already within this woman, but was dormant, had been pushed down, had been suppressed. Jesus turns to her. He looks at her. He sees her. He refers to her as God. This one whose presence could so easily be ignored because she had no value, no worth, no power, at least as things were measured in that time. But Jesus doesn't want to play that game, does not want to go by those rules, does not want to get sucked into a power play. Instead, he acknowledges her presence, her God-given value, her intrinsic worth. He, he untethers it, unleashes it. And suddenly the possibility that had been dormant <coughs> comes forth. As those prayer blankets were being passed around the room, I, I was reminded, this is actually the second congregation that I've served that has had the ministry of prayer blankets. Now, let me say, I think you all do them better. Don't tell my previous congregation, you know, but they look a lot nicer here. It's interesting to me, though, the reaction I have gotten sometimes when taking in one of those prayer blankets. Again, a lot of people are just blessed, and thank you, and this is wonderful. But on two occasions, I've asked people upon handing them a prayer blanket, they've asked, how much does it cost? One woman even turned to her husband and said, Charlie, get, get out the checkbook. As if I was going, well, yeah, today they're on sale for $29.99, <laughs> usually $39.99. I, I had someone say, I'm, I'm a shut in it, and I can't go to church anymore. As if I was holding it as a carrot, saying, yeah, hopefully you'll come to church. <laughs> I have 
one person saying, oh, it's so nice, but I'm behind on my pledge. As if I was going to say, ooh, I should have checked beforehand. I'll hold on to it until you get caught up. Do you hear, though, what is being suggested by people? Folks who resign in a world where their value is measured by the wrong stuff. As if the prayer blanket is a part of a power economy and they don't have the needed power. They don't have the status. They don't have the influence to deserve it. The prayer blanket is a gift. One that I didn't help make at all. Others with their time, their gifts, their skills have been, I was just the delivery person. But especially when people are sick, when they're feeling vulnerable, afraid, and hurting, they easily get sucked into that world where they are questioning their value, their benefit, their merit. And they think to themselves, I don't deserve it. That's the language that is birthed out of a world where power determines one's usefulness and virtue. It's a gift. If you deserved it, if you earned it, it's called a paycheck. It's a gift. A gift. I got the call about Patricia being in the hospital one afternoon. I jumped in the car, drove to the hospital, still found her in the emergency room with a broken hip. They had done x-rays and an additional scan, and we were waiting for the results. We, we got her son on the phone. He worked on the East Coast, actually in the D.C. area. He worked for a person in Congress. He told us to keep him updated. Shortly thereafter, the doctor came in, and he said something that first confused me. He said, I don't believe you fell and broke your hip. I think your hip broke, and then you fell. It was weakened. And that's when he gave her the news. There's cancer. We got her son back on the phone immediately. And he said he'd get on the next flight. He got there the next morning, and I was at the hospital when he arrived. He'd stop by the, the gift shop. He came in with a, with a plant and a balloon. He set it on the table. He leaned over and kissed his mom, pulled up a chair, took her by the hand. They hadn't been talking but maybe two minutes when she said, can you come back tomorrow? No, Mom, I, I just, I, and when he said no, you could see the startled look on her face. No, I, I can't, and then he paused, he said, of course I'll be here tomorrow, Mom, but I'm here now. I, I'm here with you now, and she said, but when you've got important things to do, why don't you go back to the house and get some work done, and you could just tell by the way she beamed, she looked at me and says, you know, he works with such important people, and, they, and they're all depending on him, and he said, Mom, I'm here. She was still trying to insert herself into a world where power and money and politics define everything, but her son remained persistent. Mom, I'm, I'm here, now, with you. And it finally, I think, clicked for her as she felt recognized that she was seen, her presence was seen by his presence, not simply because she measured up to some erroneous scale that carried with it absolutely no weight to the realm of what is important. He saw her. He was fully present to her. You want to know what business we are in here? That's the business. It's about the love of first life. It is about loving people, not because they measure up, not because they pledge enough, not because they have the right power or status. It's because they are, as we all are, precious beyond measure. God seems to make that clear. Jesus seems to double down on the idea. And so if we claim to worship God and follow Jesus, I think we know what we're supposed to do. It seems pretty clear to me. It's not about putting off the acknowledgement of someone as a precious gift until tomorrow. It's about recognizing their full presence before us and being fully present to them in the moment. And those that have felt like they don't fit into this world, that they don't have the right power or status, to have that moment where they feel recognized. changes everything. <clears throat>
we have this idea of the love first life. It looks really pretty on the top of, of no paper. When we talk about it, it's a real thing. And it's the gift that we take with us into the world. Not to be present with somebody tomorrow, but to be present with them now. And to make sure they understand what a precious gift they are. You join me in prayer. For the ministries of love and compassion shared among us and through us as a congregation, I give you thanks. O oh, gracious one who inspired such ministry. Yet too often we find ourselves stuck in a world that perceives value on some continuum. A human life is assigned to a place on a scale, using some of the most arbitrary traits and qualities, age, color of skin, nation of origin, wealth or lack thereof, job status, job, job title. How do we follow Jesus, become so easily drawn into that system, that destructive and broken system where the human family is torn apart, one part of that family put against another part. Holy and gracious God, you call us and demand of us a different world. One that you have already created in the life and teachings, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Allow for us, allow for us and the gifts that we have to find a home in your holy realm. Where power is not the currency, but love. Your relentless and reckless love put on display in Jesus. May it be for us the model. And may your spirit mentor us so that we can be that love, not tomorrow or next week, but in the current moment, where we can truly allow others to understand their value, their worth, how they are part of your beloved community. We ask this now in the name of Jesus. Who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Thank you.
you ever felt like you were dismissed by somebody? If it's somebody you respect, somebody you care about, it can hurt. All of a sudden, you feel like, I thought I was here, and now I'm here. Because the world has a scale, and it has different understandings of our value. And then Jesus shows up. And he destroys all of the structures and systems that attempt to put a value on a person. And yet what I see is a constant struggle between the two. We're in this setting and we celebrate one another. We love one another. We appreciate the gifts that people bring. And we, oh my gosh, that is just awesome what you do. And, and then we go from this place and all of a sudden we begin to find ourselves in a different world. And it's hard. And yet what we do every week is the hard work of preparing ourselves to become that alternative. Which I don't think really is the alternative. I think it's what's real. To become that expression of God's hope and dream for the world so that sisters and brothers don't feel like maybe one day I'll get to the point where I'm worthy, but to help them understand you are already a beloved child of God. That's a message that we need to share. But we pause in worship long enough to come to the table and to realize with all the baggage that we're bringing to this service this morning, all those moments in this past week, we think to ourselves, oh, Gosh, I can't believe I did that. But I'm still welcome here. It did knock me down three pegs on the scale. I'm still loved. And by living it out around this table, I think we're better able to live it out around the tables throughout the week and wherever we might find ourselves. Let me say this morning, once again, all are welcome to share in this meal. This table does not belong to this church, to the leadership team, to, to some doctrine. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And it's his love that extends an invitation to come and to share. I hope that you will participate in this meal and to encounter in the bread and cup the grace and love that is offered to you. In a few moments, those of you in the main section, you'll be invited to come forward to take a piece of bread, to dip it in the cup, and partake of the elements. If you're seated on the back row, communion will be brought to you along with the offering trays. Those of you in the balcony, you will find uh, stations where you will receive communion this morning. Once again, let me remind you, you are all welcome. You are all invited. Let us now prepare for a time to take.
and his love. Let us pray. Father, allow us to be present as we share the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Help us to live in the now with you, breathing in your presence and breathing out our thanks. May my spirit fail to chase after the next beautiful experience until I unwrap the gift of now. In Jesus' name we pray. On that night before he was betrayed, Jesus sat at the table with his disciples having a meal. And during the meal, he took a loaf of bread, just an ordinary loaf. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat from this, all of you. This is my body that will be broken for you. In a like manner, he took the cup. And after giving thanks for it, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. Every time you come together, do this in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of sin. All are welcome to this table. The meal is ready. Please come.
you for the blessings you have given us. Please give us the courage to accept where you have led us today and to give from our hearts without worry for tomorrow. May our offerings help bring hope and joy to the heartbroken. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Friend of mine at General Assembly a few weeks ago was talking about how one Sunday he preached a sermon about, again, how we're all beloved children of God and how God loves us. You know, kind of the basics. And one of his longtime members at the back door said, Wow, I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to go. And he said, You know, was he never ready to go before? But there are times when the message maybe hits us in a special way, when we feel a little better prepared. And so the hope is every Sunday, whether it is through the spoken word, whether it's through song, whether it's through ritual, that we feel a little better prepared to take this message into the world. Let me know that, as we do every Sunday, there's an invitation. An invitation to be a part of a faith community where we can work together and grow together. But that invitation includes an invitation to give one's life to Jesus Christ. And today, if you wish to respond to that invitation, you're welcome to either come forward as we are singing, or to be with one of our elders, pastors, at the close. Let us now join our voices in our hymn of discipleship. <laughs>
I invite you now to take the hand of somebody close. And let us join together in our common prairies on the screen. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in life. 